Hey, as y'all know, Pastor Greg is suffering in London today. Just kidding on that one. Uh, so we have ourselves a fill-in, and uh, let me find it right here. We would like to welcome Ross Bailey. Ross is our guest preacher this morning. He grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina. Ross has been married to his wife, Kayla, for nearly four years. He is a student at RTS in Charlotte, an intern at Christ Ridge Church in Fort Mill. Ross and Kayla have a daughter, and I cannot pronounce her name. Eliana. Yeah, that, that word. Eliana Dawn. So for announcements, uh, Children Overnight Camping is next week, May 26th and 27th at Temple. If I remember the time, it's like 7 o'clock, so it might be 6.30, 7 o'clock. Ladies Cleaning organiz, organiz, Organizing Morning, May 27th at 9 a.m., do some spring cleaning. Sunday School Snack, snack Providers will have to, uh, it's the Marshalls next week. Nursery workers are for next week is Mary Montgomery and Deb. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to you, Ross. That's all the announcements we, that I know of we got to give you this morning. Oh, I can get a Bible. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, I've already seen some of your faces uh, happily in Sunday school. Uh, some of you, I don't, there might be less faces here. I don't know. Some of you might have escaped after Sunday school. Um, sort of try not to, uh, at my own church, I wear a mic, so it's a bit different having one in front of me, so I apologize if I do that too much. Well, uh, I don't have any directions here about uh, when people stand and when people sit, uh, so I assume that the people of this church will know that pattern, uh, and I will trust you to do that. Uh, so um, there you go. Uh, let's go to our call to worship, which is where God calls us from his word uh, to worship him, sometimes by a direct call, sometimes by a display of who he is, sometimes both of those things. Uh, and this, of course, comes from the passage that will be going through uh, this morning. I hear God's word. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. Let's pray. God, our God, how worthy are you of praise, of thanksgiving, Lord, of all of our obedience, of loving you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, we need your help to do these things. We need your help to make the meditation of our heart pleasing in your sight. For, Lord, we uh, are filled with sin. We're filled with worry. We're filled with doubt. Would you help us, Lord, to praise you? Would you lift our hearts up as you come down through your Holy Spirit? And would you, O oh Lord, be pleased with our worship, the prayers of our mouths, the songs of our heart? For Christ's sake, amen. Well, we'll sing. Uh, well, the first hymn will be uh, 45, Crown Him with Many Crowns. And do whatever you do.
guess you may be seated. Uh, well, together, we'll, uh, which is here in our bulletins conveniently, uh, recite the Apostles' Creed, uh, which is about a 1,600-year-old creed that the church has used uh, to confess the truths that have been universally agreed upon. Uh, the faith we have is not new, uh, so together let us confess uh, the Apostles' Creed with the ancient church. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> Let's go to a time of uh, pastoral prayer <clears throat> together. Uh, Father, I thank you for your grace uh, that I can uh, be here. Uh, with uh, your people, though a church I am not a member of, nor people I've ever met. Yet, nevertheless, because we share a common faith, a common bond, a common spirit, that I can be with these people as if I did know them in some way. Uh, and that we, they can have me here as a stranger to them, and yet hear uh, your word from me. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for the bond that we share in Christ Jesus, a bond that transcends time and place and culture and language. Uh, Father, I, of course, know not the needs specifically of this congregation, yet you do. For you see our rising up and our sitting down. You discern our thoughts from afar. Lord, before a word is on our tongue, you know it all together. So, Father, I commend uh, these people here, your people at Temple PCA, to you. For you know their needs through and through. You know their desires, their longings, their struggles, their sufferings. You know where they need help, where they need conviction, where they need comfort. Lord, would you help them? and supply those things through your spirit and through your word, the devil-edged sword that it is that pierces to the core of who we are. Would you supply that help that they need, bringing healing to those who are sick and suffering, relief to those whose souls are heavy and burdened with sin, with sorrows, and any other thing that burdens them. Lord, open up yourself to their mind and heart as a God who welcomes. For Jesus, you said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lord, would you uh, allow this church, have this church, these people here to be a light into the community of Clover-ish area this is in? Uh, would you bring people here? that they might hear your life-giving gospel, that you might save them, Lord, and may do a work here in this community. Would you bless the work of Pastor Marshall and the elders here and the deacons as they seek to be faithful to your call at shepherding your people as under-shepherds and as servants? Lord, would you hear our prayer together that we pray according to the prayer you gave your saints long ago, even longer than the Apostles' Creed, praying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom be, um, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, well, now is the according time for tithes and offerings. Again, you know what to do, uh, but I will read uh, Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, the Lord your God, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth and all that is in it. So let us return some measure of him uh, to him who has given us all things. Let's, uh, if it's the habit, stand and sing 548. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, you can turn to Psalm 88. Um, since there is no visible clock in the sanctuary, unlike the Sunday school room, I will uh, have something on my phone to keep me attuned to the time, lest I uh, wax long and eloquent, an easy thing to do for a seminary student. So uh, go ahead, as I said, open to Psalm 88. Psalm 88. 
as I myself open there. This is God's word. Interestingly, even the title of it is God's word. I won't read that. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Shoal. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those who you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am <clears throat> shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the baton? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O oh Lord, cry to you. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companion, companions, has become darkness. Let's pray. O oh Lord, God of our salvation, Lord, this is a heavy psalm. It is hard and difficult and challenging in so many ways, but Lord, so is life. Lord, would you help me to speak faithfully to the tenor of this psalm? Lord, would you help those who listen to listen diligently, that they may uh, be encouraged and comforted and led towards you, the God of their salvation, through Christ our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> Full of troubles. Strengthless, weak, feel like dying, forgotten, abandoned, rejected, shunned, alone, overwhelmed, trapped, cast down, helpless, sorrowful, darkness. These words are words from this psalm, and I'd like to ask you how Rhetorical question, how do they make you feel? What do you think about when you think of all of these sort of dark and heavy words? <clears throat> Has this experience ever described you or someone you know or maybe presently describes you? The Lord knows your hearts, I don't, but he, this might be you presently. Have you experienced this or known someone who does, who wonders, can a Christian feel this way? Can someone who hopes in God struggle so much in the darkness? Well, I would like to explore this morning from Psalm 88, that indeed a believer can struggle such a way. Uh, and we see this very clearly in Psalm 88. 
And what I would like us to see this morning uh, is three points. Uh, very seminary student-like, hopefully very easy to remember, uh, especially because they all start with P. Uh, first, I want us to see about the pain and the darkness that the psalmist is describing. Then I want us to see, uh, learn from his pleas in the darkness. And finally, I want us to see some level of promise in the darkness. So pain, uh, pleas, and promise. Easy enough. Though not written here. Uh, so first, uh, I'd like us to draw, draw our attention to the pain of the psalmist in the darkness. Uh, and of course, darkness is a word that occurs several times in this text, and uh, it fits the title, The Glory of God in the Darkness, so I'll be sort of using that word a lot to describe things. Uh, if we look at the text, we see his pain. First, in verses 3 through 9, we see how he says, My soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. And then he picks it up again in verse 14 through the end. Why do you cast my soul away, O Lord? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up. I am helpless. Darkness has become my companion. The psalmist, as it were, uh, pilfers. He pulls together all of the words he possibly can to vividly describe the pain of his experience. His soul is full of troubles. He feels like his life is near its end. He feels like God has left him to die like the wicked and that he is no better off than they. He's lost his friends and even worse, any felt presence of God. And worse still is it seems that he has suffered this way for a long time, afflicted and close to death from my youth up. This is no melancholy day for this psalmist, or week, or maybe even month or year. It has been quite a time for him that his soul has been full of troubles and pain. Naturally, because of this, he feels trapped in his condition. But notice, however, that he only feels this way. Uh, he's describing his perception, his engagement with it. Uh, while he says in verse 4 that he says, I am counted among those who go down to the pit, he describes it further by saying, like, like, like. Verse 5, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those you remember no more. These are descriptive words describing his experience, his perception. His feelings are very real. The feelings of those who experience depression and darkness are very real. But it's not the full story. It's not the whole picture of things. He is not actually one who is destined for destruction in the pit. But that is his perception of it because of his pain, whatever is causing the pain in his life. The feelings are so strong that they feel like they're the truest reality for the psalmist. And we might think of uh, someone who we do know a bit about uh, who sort of can give us a, a case study, a fuller picture of what's going on here with the psalmist, and that's Job. Of course, we know from the book of Job that he started out as a very blessed man, a very prosperous man. So, of course, he was not afflicted from his youth up. But nevertheless, the experiences that the psalmist here is describing are so similar to the book of Job that many commentators will wonder if the psalmist here was reflecting on the life of Job or was borrowing his language from the life of Job. Because Job certainly felt rejected by the Lord, scorned by friends. He had his family taken from him. His own wife said, why don't you just curse God and die already? <laughs> My wife said that, that would be a bad day. Um, the pain for Job was very tangible, and we see all of the ways it came through in his life. And we certainly know people who have lost loved ones. 
Uh, just recently in the PCA, we lost two very well-known pastors whose families are undoubtedly grieving right now. Uh, we know people who suffer with relentless pain, illnesses that will not go away, people who have longings in their heart that are not fulfilled, people who have a seemingly outward perfect life and yet cannot escape a sense of darkness. And this psalm is a time for us to see what the darkness is like, what the darkness is like if we're a stranger to it. It's a time for us to enter into the darkness that others experience, who we who are strangers to it. I would like to give a brief note here about the causes of darkness because uh, we can sort of have a variety of thoughts in our mind and our hearts here of, well, um, like Job's friends, hey, what did he do wrong to deserve this? How is God punishing him in uh, this affliction because of something he's done? And I, uh, there's sort of, I, we might say, three causes of darkness or three causes of depression. One is circumstantial. Job, his life was ripped out from underneath of him. Everything he had was taken away from him, except his life, even his very health. And that's, if, if you're happy and skipping around when you've had everything taken from you, there's probably something wrong with you. Uh, that would be unnatural. So it's natural to go into a, a period of darkness, of depression, if circumstances uh, affect you like that. Of course, there's biological depression, which is, I'm not going to, you know, get into that. I don't know. Uh, how all of that works and chemicals in the brain and antidepressants and things that can be affected there. But there's also spiritual depression, uh, which is, uh, I think, hits closest to what we can get to in this psalm, spiritual depression. Uh, even though he appears to be struggling with circumstantial things, uh, you know, friends and companions going away from him, possibly afflictions in his body, uh, it's clear that it's, it's his soul. My soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. Uh, I have no strength. I feel like the slain. I feel like your wrath is upon me. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. This is clearly spiritual, uh, most clearly spiritual in nature. And we might be tempted to think, like Job's friends did, what did Herman the Ezraite do to deserve this? What sin did he commit? And we might be tempted to take that as well to other people's lives or even our own lives. What sin did they commit that they're, this happened to them? What sin did I commit that this is happening to me? Did I sin and that's why I'm sick with this illness? Did I sin in such a way, and that's why uh, this person died? Well, sometimes, maybe. But some people will say, well, that's the only thing that we should look to. There are situations that ca should cause us to look back to God and ask him to search us and know us and see if there's some sin that is, uh, he's disciplining us for. But some people will say, well, the only reason that God seems distant from you is because, well, you know the saying, if God is distant, who moved? Well, you must have moved. You must have sinned. You must have turned away from God. Maybe. But there's more to it. Because here we don't have any evidence of the psalmist turning from God, of any sin that he's committed of anything that he's done wrong. And of course, we know well from the book of Job that there is nothing that Job did to deserve what happened to him. And yet, God was far from him. God seemed to move from him. And it's a crushing weight for people who are in darkness to hear, uh, you must have moved from the Lord. You must have sinned somehow if that's actually not what's the case. Uh, and this psalm shows us that there's a broader, a fuller perspective that we can have there. Sometimes God pulls his felt presence away for reasons we do not understand. 
A final note here about the pain and the darkness is that it's so pervasive is that it causes the one in the darkness to forget God's former blessings. Most of the Psalms are either filled with the psalmist sometimes lamenting, sometimes being in sorrow, but then either going up to praise and rejoicing or reflecting back on something the Lord has done and taking comfort in how the Lord is with him because of what the Lord has done in the past. But that's absent here. There's no mention of how the Lord has done this in the past, or the Lord has done this in the past, or the Lord will do this, and I'll praise him for that. There's none of that. It's pervasive. It's all-encompassing. He feels trapped in it like he's in a prison cell that he cannot see out of. He is alone in the darkness, and he does not see a way out. And yet, he doesn't wallow in it. He doesn't complain in it. He takes his petitions and his prayers to God, which we'll see in the next point. But briefly here, I want to consider uh, bringing this closer to home for us, an application. First, uh, consider the kindness of God that he has given us a psalm like this. There are those who will paint a picture of Christianity that is shallow, that is uh, one that's of ease and simplicity. And uh, you might think of the prosperity gospel. You might think of other things. And the fact is that that's not the Christian life. And anyone who's lived it long enough can know that. Uh, We have ups and downs. And it would be a tragic thing if we had those ups and downs and then we had a Bible that was devoid of any descriptions of those things. Forgive my stomach growling. Didn't eat breakfast this morning. Uh, You might not hear it. I do. I'm just conscientious about that. Um, So we must reject a shallow version of Christianity that has no place for sorrow, and we must take comfort in the fact that if we experience these things, or we know people who do, that we have a God who in his infinite wisdom has given us a book with this psalm specifically tailored for that. God is merciful in that. And of course, as I said earlier, that this is a call for us to sympathize with those in darkness. It's a call for us to weep with those who weep by taking the words of the psalmist upon our own lips and bringing it to those people or using it to understand those people from the inside out. Okay, moving on to the second point. First, we had the pain and the darkness. Now let's notice the plea and the darkness, or pleas, really, multiple. If we turn back to the psalm, we see in verses 1 and 2 and then 9 through 14, where he uh, he says, O Lord God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. But I, O Lord, cry out to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. So the psalmist is bringing these things in fervent, persistent prayer to the Lord. He's not content to just turn away from the Lord and say, well, you've done this. I'm going to reject you. I'm going to turn away from you. And I'll find some earthly solution. I'll find pleasure in this. I'll find relief in that. No, he takes his case to the Lord and argues it with the Lord or presents his pleas before the Lord, which, of course, makes us think of Job, who does the same thing. And uh, I was reading Job one time, and the thing that struck me is Job is commended for the way he wrestles with God. His friends are condemned. And I think one of the reasons is because Job actually talks to the Lord. His friends just talk about the Lord. And that's what we see in the psalm as someone who doesn't just talk about the Lord. He talks to the Lord. He expresses his doubt and faith uh, in God as his ultimate salvation. And I want us to know the sort of three subpoints here of these prayers, of these pleas. The first thing is that they're persistent, keeping on with the peas. They're persistent. We know this in verses 1, 9, and 13 of how day and night 
Uh, I spread out my hands to you day and night. Every day I call upon you. He doesn't just send up one prayer and say, well, that's good enough. That, that'll take care of it. No, he, he goes on and on crying like a, like a child who cries in their crib. Uh, and as, uh, I, as a father, I can now sort of uh, sympath- or resonate with this illustration more. Uh, of a, you know, having a daughter who cries and cries and cries and cries and cries and cries. And I'm just like, sometimes I get frustrated. It's like, is she ever going to stop crying when, you know, we have to put her down for a nap or put her down to sleep at night? But she just goes on and on. It seems like she'll never get tired of crying. And then eventually me, or usually my wife, um, because she is a t- kinder, tenderer person, will come and relieve our daughter of her distress, of feeling alone and forsaken. And and this this is the way the psalmist approaches God. He is like a child crying. He does not give up. And we don't know the end of the story. But, you know, I wonder if he would ever give up until the Lord delivers him. Second is that the, the second sub point is that the prayers are personal. He does not talk to God in an abstract way, in a cold, impersonal way, uh, uh, just rehearsing theology, oh Lord, I know this is true of you, I know this is true, uh, you know, sort of mechanical. Rather, they're, they're personal. If you read the psalm and you know every time it says, me, I, my, I think every single verse has at least one of those, if not multiples in it. You, me, I, me, my, over and over and over and over again. It's personal for him. And you also see that it's personal in how he uses you. You, you, over and over again. You, Lord, you, Lord, you, you have done this. You have put me here. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? He's using personal language here. God is a person and he relates to him as a person and his distress We need to remember that, that God is a person. He created us. We reflect his image as people. And the way that we approach each other, we can also approach God. We don't need to have sophisticated language. We don't need to, uh, as much as I love it, read the Valley of Vision. We don't need uh, to write down our prayers uh, for God to be pleased with them. We don't need to endlessly repeat the same thing. We can approach God as we approach each other, simplistically, personally, persistently. And final sub-point is that the the psalmist here, he questions God in faith. And it's somewhat of a challenging point of, is it okay to question God? Because on one hand... He's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's perfectly good and holy, so he doesn't do anything bad. So I shouldn't question him. I should only have perfect faith in him. Seems true. Yet, the psalmist here does question the Lord, and so does Job. And, of course, we know that Job is commended for his dealings with the Lord, though he certainly had some imperfections. And so here we also see that the psalmist questions God based on his condition. He's essentially saying, what good comes from being like those who die and lie in the grave? Can I praise you there? Will I not be able to praise you better in the light than in the darkness? He doesn't see the point of his suffering and his pain. He, see, he thinks that his condition is less than ideal to praise God in, and so he questions He continues to cry out to God specifically and personally and persistently in questions. And it's interesting also here that the psalmist is not dealing with a generic deity. He's dealing with the Lord. It's it's the Lord's personal name, Yahweh, Jehovah, whatever you use for that. He uses that four times here. O Lord, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, over and over again. He's questioning this God. 
And yet he's doing it in faith because he's questioning to God's face. He's not questioning if this God exists. He's questioning to God's face, wishing for an answer, wishing for an explanation. And that is where we see his faith and that he uses these personal titles for the Lord. That he even says, God of my salvation. Thinking again of application for this point, do you talk to God like this? Do you feel like you can? Do you think like he is okay with you to pray so transparently, so persistently, so personally, so painfully? If you don't feel like you can talk to God like this, then I hope this psalm can encourage you to talk to God like this. Not all the time, because I hope that your life is not in the darkness all the time. But if it is, you can take it to the Lord as the song goes, you know, to the Lord in prayer. He has spoken to us specifically in this psalm to give us words to say that are this confrontational, that are this questiony to the Lord. A question we might have about this psalm and the pleas in the darkness are, uh, where, do they, where do these pleas find their answer? Where do these requests find their answer? Where can we find hope in the darkness? Where can we find light in the darkness? Well, uh, to do so, we have to sort of venture outside the psalm. And this is the final point, the promises in the darkness. Uh, we have to venture out. I'll point to one point here in the psalm, but largely we, we do have to venture outside the psalm, which we can do because we have not just the psalm. We have a whole Bible of God's word, a whole Bible of God's dealing with his people, a whole Bible of God's promises. But we also should, for a moment, before we reach outside this psalm, dwell here for just a few more moments. <clears throat> and I'll have uh, several sub-points here that try to make it easier to remember. Staying within the psalm is the first point here. The first promise, if we could call it that, is that the Lord is behind the darkness. Throughout this psalm, there are at least 12 times where the psalmist directly puts God as the reason for his situation. Just for an example, in verses 6 through 8, he says, You have put me in the depths of the pit, and the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My, my, <clears throat> my companion, the last line here, has become darkness. Somehow the psalmist is finding encouragement to keep praying persistently and that the, psalmist, the, the Lord is behind the condition that the psalmist is in. God, he sees God as sovereign here. He does not see God as out of the picture, as uh, taken by surprise, as helpless. This is often a way that um, some Christians might appeal to problems in people's lives. Oh, the Lord had nothing to do with that. The Lord is not involved in that situation. Uh, that, uh, that was the work of Satan or just your own sin or whatever. And of course, sin and Satan play a role, serious role in the Christian life in terms of tearing us down and afflicting us. But the Lord is not uh, aloof. The Lord is not far. The Lord is not uh, hands off. Sorry, uh, I didn't do that. Uh, that's not the way we see the psalmist here, and that's not the way that the whole Bible gives us a picture of the Lord. Uh, the Lord is involved, and that is a challenging thing to accept how the Lord is doing this to the psalmist, why he's doing it to the psalmist. And I can't give ultimate answers or immediate answers for that. But he is, and the psalmist sees it that way. 
Uh, secondly, sub-point, uh, is because uh, the Lord is in control, is behind these things, the Lord is also with the psalmist in this. He's with him. Of course, we know Psalm 23 so well. The Lord is my shepherd, where he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know of no better psalm to describe the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Or Psalm 139, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me. Sounds like that's what's going on here. And the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light. So although the psalmist feels like he is alone, he's not. Thinking back to the illustration of the crying child, uh, now dear and, near and dear to my heart, when our daughter or a child is crying in their crib, we, the parents, are on the other side of that door. We're not putting our child in a different house, a different apartment, where uh, there is no way for us to know that our child's crying, uh, no way to care. Rather, we're right on the other side of the door in our small apartment. We don't need a baby monitor. We can hear her cry wherever she is. And at some point, after we hear her for long enough, we're going to come deliver her. But the whole time, we're there with her behind the scenes. There's no harm that could happen to her because we're there for her. Uh, there's no way that she's going to go without food or without what she needs, a diaper change, because we're still there with her, though we're behind a closed door. And so we may feel about the Lord that he has hidden himself from us and that he's no longer with us, but he promises to never leave or forsake us. Behind the, frown, behind the darkness, behind the frowning providence, he hides a smiling face uh, from uh, God moves in a mysterious way. And how do we see fully that uh, the, the, the Lord is with us? It's that the Lord has experienced these things. Looking back at the words that the psalmist uses to describe himself and his situation, weak, forgotten, abandoned, shunned, alone, helpless, sorrow, darkness, I can't help but wonder how many of these could be used to describe our Lord before his crucifixion. He says in Matthew 26, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And then, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How many of these struggles, these cries, these pains that the Lord himself experienced in his life on the earth with us. Hebrews 5, 7, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And indeed he was, but not immediately saved. We can thus take comfort knowing that the Lord knows the darkness himself uh, because he has been in it. The worst darkness that could ever happen to any person ever surely was the darkness that the Lord experienced upon the cross when he bore the weight of sinful man's sin, when he lay in the grave for three days until his resurrection. The psalmist questions of, do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the baton? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Finds its affirmative in Christ. Yes, God does work wonders for the dead. Yes, his steadfast love is declared in the grave. And his wonders are known in the darkness and his righteousness in the land of forgetfulness, because Christ experienced those things, went there, whatever is fully meant by he descended to hell in our Apostles' Creed, and he came back. He came up from the darkness. 
through his own resurrection, he has secured us a hope that we can have regarding this point. And now the final, final thing here, closing. The final promise that we can have in the darkness is that the Lord will ultimately shine forth his light through it. That he will finally and fully remove all of the darkness and turn it into light. Paul says in Romans that we have a weight of glory that awaits us, a hope of glory that awaits us, a a hope of glory that is far exceeding whatever trials and difficulties and sufferings and depressions and darkness and loss that we experience here. Paul could say that well as someone who also experienced those things. As another psalm goes, Darkness may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. The problem is if we, is if we interpret that as, a, as in tomorrow morning. Uh, the joy will come tomorrow morning. Well, what if the joy doesn't come tomorrow morning? Well, it might not come tomorrow or the next week or even the next month. Uh, consider those who live in Alaska. I had a friend who lived in Alaska while I was in college, and I made sure I asked him if this illustration was true, and he said it was, so fact-checked. Consider those who live in Alaska, uh, that for a part of the winter, uh, because of where they are on, on the earth, the sun does not shine upon them. They do not have a daytime, or if there is any daytime, it's like an hour. And so for them, they can't say, well, light will come tomorrow morning, light will come next week's morning, or maybe even night will come next month's morning. But they can surely say, the light will come in the morning. They just mean a morning when the seasons change. The light will indeed shine again in Alaska when the seasons change. And how much more of a hope and certainty do we have than the people who live in Alaska, that one day light will shine upon us and wipe out darkness forever for everyone who is in Christ. Closing from uh, several passages in Revelation 22 and 21, strung together. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. They will see his face, and on his name, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. There will be they will have no need of light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light and They will reign with him forever and ever. This is the greatest promise that every believer in Christ has in the darkness. Uh, It's sure to come. It might not be tomorrow or next month, but this this ultimate darkness, this this ultimate undoing of darkness, this ultimate removal of darkness will come. And I pray it even comes now that I would... Uh, Christ Jesus would come back for us and deliver us from this world of pain and darkness now. As he has encouraged us to pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. So may we take comfort in this darkness, knowing that in his light, uh, we will have um, a fullness of light, even if we walk in darkness now, that the Lord of light is with us in that darkness. Amen. I guess we will, uh, we will stand and we will sing a beautiful hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
I am, but that was a perfect one to end this, uh, come at the end of this service. Let's pray. Uh, God, you are great. Even when we walk in darkness, even when sorrows are about us on uh, every side, Lord, you do not change. You are the same. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, I pray for your blessing upon your people here at Temple, that the word and songs and prayers uh, that have been uttered would uh, go with them through this week as you go with them, and that you would turn them to you, that you would lift up the shining face of your countenance upon them and bless them, even as they walk in this weary land, and that you might grant them hope and eternity when you shall surely deliver us from every evil, every pain, and every sorrow into your everlasting glory and light beyond all comprehensions. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. That's some doxology.